Hello, welcome to another virtual program with Maine Historical Society. I'm Kathleen Newman. It's February 8th, 2022. And this is our book talk on Peaks Island Past and Present with author Kimberly McIsaac. Uh, Kimberly is a fourth generation Peaks Islander who has researched, written, and lectured about Peaks Island history for over 30 years. She is the author of The Casco Bay Islands, 1850 to 2000, and has written and edited newsletters and booklets for museums and historical societies where she served in many roles, director, curator, educator, and fundraiser. She also coordinated the Maine Civil War Trail created for the sesquicentennial of the Civil War in 2013. Kim now divides her time between serving on three nonprofit boards and operating her seasonal business, Peak Island Tours, which provides guided tours of the island. Kimberly, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for uh, helping out with all the technological aspects. I've never done one of these things before and I am not tech savvy. It's okay, it's our pleasure uh, to have you and uh, so far so good, you're doing a great job. So I'm gonna bring up your slides and whenever you're ready, uh, you can be begin your presentation. Okay, uh, Big Silent Past and Present is really the combination of my almost 40 years of, uh, of uh, research on Peak's history. And it's really an outgrowth of my master's thesis at USM, which uh, focused on tourism in Casco Bay. Um, but I really got interested in history when I was a young child. Uh, my parents and grandmother would sit around talking about this person or that person. Um, or some event that had happened and uh, come to find out the people had died decades before, the events had occurred decades before. And sometimes when I'm out bike riding with my dad, he would stop at a house and tell a story. He'd sometimes introduce me to what I thought was some very old people, um, sea captains and so on. And they had incredible stories. And all of that just really piqued my, my interest. I found it very fascinating. So as I got older, I uh, started to research. And the more I researched, the more interested I got. There was so much out there, not easy to find because there's not a lot of written materials, but it was, I, it was just so much. And uh, I came to realize that, you know, this island did not evolve and grow into what it is in some sort of an isolated bubble. A lot of people think that simply because we're separated from Portland by all that water. Um, it was the, all the changes that happened out here and all the growth that has occurred has, have really been influenced by um, events, you know, regional events, uh, national, global events. And uh, it's all very much interrelated. Um, so we started out as a fishing post, outpost. Uh, then it became this incredible, incredibly uh, popular amusement center. World War II comes, the island becomes a military base. And uh, after that, the tourists have returned. Yet through all these changes, it's still remained just a residential neighborhood in the city of Portland. And um, so we're really, it's, it's, it's quite, a, quite a history we have here. Um, but the European presence in Casco Bay uh, began in the 1500s with European fishermen coming in the summer, catch the fish and take it back to Europe to, uh, to sell. Um, they were certainly aware of Peaks Island and the other islands, as was Sir Christopher Levitt, an early explorer who came into the bay in 1623. And he is the first European to build a house here. Now, where the house was, we're not sure. Some people say it was House Island. Some say Cushing, some say Peaks. All we know is that his, in his journal that he left behind, he talks about building a house uh, on one of the islands. He also indicates in his journal that uh, the islands were inhabited by, by uh, Native peoples, uh, Native American peoples. Um, but they were the first ones here. So I think we can uh, move on to the next slide. Uh, the 
first European to some settle on peaks were the descendants of George Cleave. Um, Cleave is considered the uh, founder of the city of Portland. And um, <clears throat> he came here in 1632. And uh, many years later in the 1990s, his descendants erected a statue of Cleave. It's down on the waterfront, uh, right where the narrow gauge railroad was, right on the shore there, on the, you know, and uh, looking out over the harbor. Uh, uh, the Portland Peninsula, South Portland waterfront and Peaks Island were part of his lands. So he's there looking out over his domain. Uh, of course, there were no images of Cleve, uh, no oil paintings or anything like that. So this is what the uh, descendants figured he looked like based on how they look. Um, we don't have any, any idea of what kind of a house he built either, but uh, the house that he built was down uh, on the waterfront, um, about where Ocean Gate is now, the foot of uh, four in India streets. And uh, basically you can see this sketch shows how heavily forested was, and that's where the name Forest City came from. Um, he and his wife, Elizabeth, had one, had one child. Uh, his wife was Joan, his daughter was Elizabeth. And Elizabeth married a man named Michael Mitten, uh, who among other things was a fisherman. We can move on again to the next slide. Uh, Mitten um, was basically a fisherman, although he was involved in a lot of other things as well. Some nice, some not so nice, according to legend. Uh, but he was a fisherman. And um, his family erected this, his descendants erected this uh, monument to him in 1997 on Peaks Island. If you've been out here, it's just up from the wharf and it calls him a gentleman, which uh, might be a stretch if you listen to any of the stories that have come down about him. But he lived from about 1600 to 1660 roughly. And um, Mitten had five children, two of his daughters, married Brackett brothers from Portsmouth. And that's where the Brackets come into Portland. You're all familiar with Brackett Street and so on. Um, and uh, the other image over here is uh, from the 1850s, actually. It's on House Island, and it shows the fish flakes that Mitten and all the other fishermen in the bay uh, had. They would spread these big, big uh, wooden tables out. The fish would be laid on the tables, heavily salted and dried in the sun, and then packed in barrels going back to, uh, to be taken back to Europe for sale. Um, and these are a couple of uh, Mitten's descendants right there sitting there at the time. Um, there were attempts to settle on, on the islands. I think we can move on again. Um, The brackets were here. They were selling on the mainland. They did not settle on, on Peaks Island. Um, there were other families that did come out here um, by the name of Waite, Mansfield, Scott, to name a few. Um, but they didn't stay very long. And the settlers in Portland didn't stay very long. Uh, the natives uh, conducted a lot of hostilities over the years. Three wars, King William's War, Queen Anne's War, the French and Indian War. And it wasn't really until 1759 that all of that settled down and people began returning. The Brackets returned to Portland. And um, a couple years later, 1762, one of the Brackett ladies, thankful Brackett, and her husband, Benjamin Trott, settled on Peaks Island. And they are considered the first um, permanent residents of Peaks Island. They built a big log cabin uh, where the parking lot is adjacent to the wharf. And uh, their descendants uh, just proliferated and are still here today. Um, so we can move on again. Of course, the first thing they did was build their homes and barns. And then normally the early settlers would build a meeting house. Well, they certainly did have uh, uh, you know, worship services. But they didn't get around to building a proper meeting house until 17, uh, 1861 when the Brackett Church was built. One of the first things they did after, build, after building their homes was they wanted to provide education for their children. So they hired this man, Joseph Reed, who was the 
husband of Mary Brackett, another Mary Brackett. Um, and uh, he was the first schoolmaster. He conducted classes in the room of a house uh, that is still here, although it's greatly enlarged. And uh, by 1832, the number of children on the island had grown to the point where they couldn't all fit into that one room. So the island residents uh, petitioned the city of Portland uh, for a schoolhouse. They wanted a proper school building. Well, the city, for unknown reasons, um, did not want to do that. But they did give the island residents $200 of city money and told them to build their own schoolhouse, which they did. This is the building that was the school, a one-room schoolhouse right on the main street. Uh, the photo, of course, was from the 18, 1950s when it had become the Grange Hall. Um, but that's where the first school, school classes were held. And uh, eventually they outgrew it and a four-room school was built, the Brook School that's here now, um, plus a couple of additions later on. Um, but this was also the time period that saw the beginning of tourism in Casco Bay. Um, and if we can move on to the next slide. Um, tourists started coming over to Peaks Island as early as the 1820s. They would sail or row across the harbor in the summer. And at times, the harbor would actually freeze solid enough that they could come over in a horse-drawn sleigh or perhaps ice skate across. And 1822, uh, the first steamboat appeared in Casco Bay. It was called the Kenny Beck. Captain Seward Porter brought her in. Um, she wasn't exactly the most powerful steamboat. Um, her engine wasn't strong enough to run against the tide and very often, the uh, passengers would have to tread the, the wheel, the paddle wheel, to get into, into the wharf. Um, she only lasted one summer, but she, it, it's important because it was the very first steamboat in Casco Bay. Um, others followed, and uh, more and more every summer, bringing more and more people. And by the 1850s, the early 1850s, there were two hotels on Peak Island. So things were moving along pretty well as far as the tourism uh, industry um, goes. Um, the Civil War did dampen it a little bit, but after the Civil War ended, the um, island really exploded uh, as far as tourism goes. By the 1890s, 1900, we had 16 hotels out here, um, dozens of boarding houses, uh, a building boom, hundreds of summer cottages built, um, three summer stock theaters, uh, a boardwalk with all kinds of amusement stands, and an actual amusement park with rides like a Ferris wheel and a merry-go-round. And this was the place to be. It was people visited from all over, all over the country, hundreds of thousands of people um, during the summer season, which then was just July and August. Um, and there were dozens of steamboats in the bay by then. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, well, this was the heyday, actually, of the island. You can see the crowds of people coming in off the ferry up in the upper left-hand corner. Two ferries are pulled in at the wharf down front at Forest City. The wharf is still in the same place. Um, and next to it on the right, balloon ascensions. These, these were the big, this was the big attraction. Um, if you've been to Peaks and have walked up the hill to the Inn on Peaks, this is where the in on peaks would be at the bottom of this hill. And uh, you can just see the crowd, a huge crowd of people there watching the balloon ascensions. But they not only watched, you could actually go up in the balloon. However, it was tethered to the ground, so you would just go up and down several times. And if you were really lucky, ropes would come loose and you'd float out over the harbor and have an actual ride, um, which did happen quite often, I think. They did have somebody in the basket who knew how to control it. And they kept a boat down on the beach specifically to bring the basket back in when that happened. And the, um, <clears throat> the photo on, on the bottom there is of Greenwood Garden, about 1900. Huge crowd of people in the garden for some sort of an activity. So this was really, this was, this was the place to be. It was extremely crowded. Um, I think in many ways more crowded than it is today. Of course, there were no cars, but uh, horses and buggies everywhere. And uh, 
we all know what happens with dirt roads and, and, and horses. It was uh, probably not the healthiest place to be in the summer, shall we say. Um, but there were um, many, many ways to get here. So we can move on to the next slide. Dozens of steamboat lines by 1900s running in the bay. Some had one or two ferries, other had, others had many more. Uh, you could actually get on a steamboat, stop at all the uh, islands, the inherited, inhabited islands, which are much more than, than there are today, go to Brunswick and all the way to Bath. Um, and the steamboats ranged in size from very small to this one, the Pilgrim, which is the largest of the steamboats. You can see it has three decks. It could take up to 1,200 passengers per, per trip. And it did make several trips a day to Peaks Island in the summer. It also went to other islands. And sometimes it even went out to, down to Old Orchard Beach uh, when you could land at that you know, pier that was much, much longer than it is today. So it was, it was very busy. Um, eventually, a lot of these lines went out of business or they merged and uh, coalesced into what's now Casco Bay Lines. So we have had steamboat service here for a very long time. Um, okay, we can move on. But we didn't quite get to the end of the tourist um, the tourist uh, season. By 1930, things were pretty much quieted down. The depression caused a lot of people to lose their summer homes. No job, no money. You couldn't come over just for the day and have some fun. Uh, the automobile took its toll. Uh, people were just as crazy as we are about our cars. They would just jump in their car and go explore some new place. But the big problem was fires. There had been a number of smaller fires um, and then 1934, the Gem Theater, one of the summer stock theaters burned, spectacular blaze in the middle of the night. There had been a political rally there that evening. And of course, each party blamed the other for starting the fire. Although the fire marshal determined that it was an unextinguished cigarette butt that somebody had thrown in a wastebasket in the basement. And being in the middle of the night, everybody was home asleep and it just burst into flames eventually. Two years later, we had a huge fire uh, down the front of the island, 1936. It, it uh, burned 17 buildings along the front of the island. Uh, a couple of hotels, a number of amusement stands, a um, number of private homes, and none of this was ever rebuilt. So this was really the end of the, the big entertainment amusement era on Peaks Island, but it wasn't quite the end. Of, of the tourism and it still continued on. Um, but the 1930s were quiet other than that. I think we can go on to the next uh, slide. 1942, the war breaks out, World War II. And Peaks, of course, was chosen for a very large uh, army base. The whole bay was really heavily fortified um, between the Liberty ships being made in South Portland the trains bringing in all the equipment and supplies to go over to Europe. Um, Peaks though did have a small military presence during World War I. A small contingent of soldiers who operated a spotlight that was on high ground, on ground in the center of the island. And that spotlight was operated by a generator which was housed in this little yellow building you can see here in the slide. Um, that building is still here. And the uh, spotlight was used during World War II as well. But the army came in, the government came in and built a full scale army base, 200 acre army base. that had everything that a typical army base would have. There were between eight and 900 soldiers stationed here at any time during the war, which was several hundred more than the island population. Um, and all the latest equipment and technology was brought here. We had a radar tower, which was a new, new invention. Uh, what you see here, this fort here, this is battery steel. And I'm sure some of you have been out to see battery steel. Um, battery steel is the largest gun emplacement ever built in Maine, about 800 feet long. It mounted two 16 inch cannon. These are the same guns that were found on the battleships of the era. 
And fortunately, they never had to uh, fire them at the enemy, but they did test fire them. And uh, first time they test fired them, I, it seems that they forgot to warn people that this was gonna happen. When people heard those guns booming and the vibrations felt all over the island, uh, window panes cracked, things fell off shelves. People panicked, they thought the Germans had arrived. And I think after that, the, uh, the government was, the, the army was a little bit uh, more cautious and let people know if they were gonna test fire them after that. Um, but they were here, um, all those soldiers after the war, the guns, all the guns, there were much, there were smaller guns, 12 inch guns, 90 millimeter, 40 millimeter, goes on and on. They were all cut up and sent down to Bethlehem Steel to be recycled. And um, the soldiers disappeared as quickly as they came. But they left a caretaker uh, to take care of all the buildings and so on. They left all their equipment other than the, the guns and the ammunition. But we can move on again. Fire struck again, 1957. On May of 1957, a fire broke out in the Army Reservation. And uh, I don't know what, I don't, the caretaker didn't, didn't notice it. They had mowed the lawn there, you know, any of the grass or anything in a long time. A lot of broken glass hanging around and uh, very hot and sunny. And with that sun beating down on all that broken glass for a long time, um, it just smoldered until it burnt, you know, burst into flame. And uh, nearly 300 acres of the island burned in that fire. It was very scary. Um, what was left? A lot of brick chimneys you can see here. I remember these brick chimneys. People knocked them down and took the bricks home. And the uh, concrete building there is still here. It's now been converted into a home. So again, that was recycled and it's excellent example of island recycling. We never throw anything out here. Everything was reused. Um, so if you've been to the island, you've been walking on the backside or in the center of the island, all that uh, growth of vegetation that you see has grown up since 1957. That fire burned for three days before it finally was put out. But also after the war, brought a new energy to the island. Um, there was a lot of empty housing, uh, which was actually goes back to the, um, the depression with people losing their, their property. Um, it, a lot of it was lived in by uh, war workers during the war. Some of the soldiers brought their family. They left, the housing was empty again. And it could be bought for very, very low cost. So a lot of young families were able to buy homes um, for next to nothing. And uh, Many of them are still here. And it also brought a new crop of summer people um, from all over the country. The uh, family that you see here is from the Boston area and they had seven children, yet they could afford to buy a summer cottage because it was essentially the same amount of money as buying a new car back then. And uh, there were many, many families like this who came summers and they're still here. And many of them, when they, finally get to retirement age, they retire here and stay here. Um, so I think we can move on. And this is that same family a few years ago, that same family with the seven children. There are now seven spouses, 21 grandchildren and 31 great grandchildren. And they gather every summer, nearly all of them come to celebrate the birthday of the matriarch of the family, the lady you see right in the middle with the uh, turquoise colored slacks. She is the oldest resident of Peaks Island at the age of 105. So you might wonder what keeps people here? Why, what keeps people coming back? Whether it's the year round people who stay, the summer people who stay for generations. And what, what, what brings people to move here, the new people that come? Well, I think it's really the sense of community. Um, people get to know one another. It's peaceful, it's quiet. Um, people are still very civil to one another out here. Um, there's always somebody to help you out. If you need help with anything, there's always somebody here that, that will come and help you out. Um, 
In fact, we have over 20 nonprofits on this island. And each one of those nonprofits, uh, nonprofits has uh, a different goal, but when you bring it all together, it really enriches our community life out there. Um, but still, this is not a utopia around here. We do have our issues, like any community does, but we try to solve them in a simple way. Um, you don't see people fighting in the streets or anything like that. Uh, people are really very nice to one another. Um, but we still get a lot of visitors. We can move on to our next slide. This was this past summer. Peaks has been discovered by the throngs of summer people once again. And these are day trips. Summer people are people who come and stay in their own cottage for the summer or part of the summer. They might rent for a couple weeks or a month. They're part of the community. What we see here are essentially day trips. There are just thousands and thousands of them coming over. Um, this year, we, a lot of us agree that there were far more people, day trippers coming to Peaks Island this year than the two previous years before COVID hit. Uh, we have been discovered once again. And uh, this is very stressful. We have just a handful of small businesses out here um, and they're having a difficult time uh, providing what these people want. Everybody is, it's very overwhelming. Um, think about an ice cream shop in July that closes early in the afternoon because they run out of ice cream, even though their, their um, freezers are fully stocked. And the other problem is we have only two public restrooms on Peaks Island. So think about that with these thousands of people coming over. And uh, it's just, it's just incredible. And uh, there's a lot of worry about, you know, how is this going to affect the environment out here? You know, we can't go on like this. We're at the tipping point right now, but they still come. And I think they come because they, I don't know why they come other than they think it's gonna be beautiful and peaceful. And there's really nothing for them to do out here to speak of. We don't have the amusements that we used to have. But um, anyway, in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in my writing, I have tried to bring together how all of these outside uh, activities and influences have shaped the community to be what it is today. Um, and I think that's probably going to continue for quite a long time to come. Um, and I do hope that you'll be able to read the book and enjoy it. We can go on to the next uh, slide. Um, if you're interested, you could, it's available in the Maine Historical Society bookstore, local bookstores, uh, Maine Authors Publishing uh, .com website, and my peaksislandtours.com website as well. So I think we have time for some questions. Yep, absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Kimberly. Um, and I'm going to share the link to to where you can purchase the book uh, through MHS. If you're interested, I'm going to share that in the chat in a moment. Uh, folks, if you've got questions, you can type them into the chat or into the q and I'm going to start us off. Um, Kimberly, so what made you, you know, you've lived on Peaks Island forever. You uh, operate a, a tour company out there, work with lots of museums and nonprofits. Um, what made you just decide to uh, put all this history uh, into a book? My husband kept harassing me about it. He said, <laughs> there you go. too much time going around and finding all this research and piling it up in the house. He says, you got to do something. So when COVID struck and we all got under lockdown, what else did you do? So I just sure. sat down, set my mind to it and wrote. Excellent. Someone in the audience is asking, do we know why it's called Peaks Island? We do not. Um, the map on the cover of the book was drawn in 1795 by Peleg Washington, and it clearly identifies Peaks Island as Peaks Island. Um, we don't know why. There are several theories. One is that it rises to a peak in the center of the island. Uh, one is that a, a British soldier named uh, Colonel Peak had some connection, but there's been no documentary evidence of that. Uh, another is that a, a Boston businessman named Samuel uh, Stephen Parks um, claimed to have owned the island. 
you know, the way people wrote back then, the A could have been, you know, the R could have been mistaken for an A. Um, and there were a lot of deeds that got passed around, bogus deeds. If you had a business debt to pay off, you paid off with a deed, you know. And the, the fourth one that I, I like the best, but I know is not true, was told to me by an old sea captain. It was actually printed in the paper a couple of times that pirates used to hang out in the coves around the island and they would peek out to see if it was uh, safe. Well, the little coves on the island are not big enough or deep enough to more a pirate ship. And I think he was just trying to entertain the kids. Yeah, that's certainly a fun, <laughs> a fun idea, but if, if it maybe is. not super yeah. likely. But we don't know why, where, where the name came from. Okay. Do you know how, how large is the island? How many permanent residents live there? There, I, This is some, from someone in the audience who's also asking, is there a bridge connection? There's no bridge to, to Pete's Oh, on. don't mention a bridge. <laughs> someone proposed that at one time uh, back in the 60s. And uh, a lot of the people on the island got together and said, if that ever happens, we know someone right here on the island who's a demolitions expert for the Navy. <laughs> this is World War II. He went around blowing up bridges where they were. He said, we'll get him to work and get rid of it. No one wants a bridge. No one wants a bridge. Um, <laughs> no one wants a bridge. <laughs> but it's about 720 acres. And we estimate there's between 900 and 1,000 year-round residents. People move on and off frequently. Mm -hmm. Certain you know, population. So we're really not sure, but between 900 and 1,000. In the summer, there's about another 40,000 to 4,500 who actually stay here, you know, in the cottages and so on. Can you speak at all to the 6th and 17th main camps on the island? Uh, what we have here is the 5th Main Regiment Memorial Hall mm -hmm. and 8th Main Regiment Memorial. Those were regimental halls built by um, the veterans of those regiments. And the families would take turns vacationing there. Um, and they would have annual reunions uh, and veterans from other regiments would come. Of course, Joshua Chamberlain appeared at all of them. You couldn't have a Civil War gathering without Chamberlain. Um, the 5th Main is now a nonprofit museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, the 8th Main is still owned by the descendants of the 8th Main soldiers. They have an association. And if you can trace your um, ancestry back to an eighth main soldier, you can become a member. But that too was operated as a, what they call a living history lodge. You can rent a room and vacation like the veterans did. But both of those buildings are on the National Register of Historic Places. Do you know anything about how fresh water gets to the island? Well, the water district. We have underwater water mains from the mainland. So yeah, and we should clarify too for folks that may not be aware that Peaks Island is, it's part of the town of Portland. It's not its own separate town or city. Right. Um, is the Umbrella Cover Museum still open? <laughs> yes, she is open in the summer. Uh, basically Memorial Day through into September. Nice. Um, let's see. Uh, have you ever considered um, coordinating with uh, what the Wabanaki Confederation to talk um, about the use of the island by Native peoples? That has been under discussion by uh, Peaks Island Historical Society. So that, that may happen in the future. That would be great. Um, can you tell us a little bit too about your... Um, about your uh, tour company. Well, my daughter started the business when she graduated from college in 2003. She didn't have a job yet. And uh, when she finally got a job with benefits, she said, mom, you're about to retire, you take it over. So we provide uh, guided tours of the island on six and eight passenger golf carts, uh, three times a day, electric golf carts, so it's quiet and you're not breathing in you know, fumes from the, from the gas engines. It's by reservation only. They're about an hour and a half long. And we take you all around the island and give you a good 
uh, overview of everything to do with peace. Excellent. And what's, can you remind us uh, the website for your? It's peaksislandtours.com. Peaksislandtours.com. I'm going to put that in the chat uh, also. Um, can you speak to the education on the island? Did they used to have a, like a one room schoolhouse there? Yes, um, the school used to go uh, from uh, kindergarten through grade eight. These mm -hmm. days it goes from pre-K through grade five. Uh, then the, the middle and high school kids commute to Portland uh, to school. We also have uh, a Peak Island Children's Workshop, which is basically daycare. It started as a daycare. And uh, there are a lot of after-school programs for kids and, and a lot of uh, different clubs. They have a ski club. They go here, they go there. There's, you know, baseball teams, soccer teams. Um, so the kids have everything they need. It's Portland Public Schools. And the kids, um, they take the ferry too once they're uh, in high school. Yes, to take the ferry to the mainland, yeah. go to the port. Yeah. Middle school and high school, the buses meet them right at the wharf and take them to their schools. Yeah. Very good. Um, can you tell us anything about, uh, so you said you spent a lot of the winter, you know, doing research for the book. What resources did you use for that research? Oh, I was all over. Main historic, of course, uh, Greater Portland Landmarks, uh, Historic Preservation Commission, uh, the Maine State Library, um, National Archives, uh, all different kinds of repositories, um, as well as interviewing a lot of people. People have incredible family histories and scrapbooks and all that online. Um, there's just a lot, lot out there. It just takes time to ferret it all out. Sure. And for those of you uh, in our audience, uh, if you're looking for uh, more information on not just Peaks Island, but all of Maine history, um, be sure to visit our online database, Maine Memory Network at mainmemory.net. You can find a lot of great historical records, photographs there. And if you have your own stories, uh, memories of Peaks Island that you would like to share, you can share them uh, through Maine Memory Network um, via My Maine Stories. So check that out if you haven't uh, had a chance. Uh, someone's also asking, so if, if students commute uh, to the mainland on the ferries, uh, what do they do about school when the seas are rough on <laughs> sunny days? Well, the only time the ferries do not run is when the winds get so high that the Coast Guard deems it's unsafe for anyone to be on the water. And that did happen when we had that first really bad windstorm a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. But the ferries run the um, harbor is usually pretty, not too, not too rough. Um, you know, if a parent wants to keep their child home because they think it's unsafe, that's one thing, but um, you know, they still go to school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much again, uh, Kim. Uh, we're excited uh, to read the book. Um, remember, folks, you can purchase a copy at mainhistorystore.com. Uh, um, thank you so much uh, for giving us a, a taste of some of the history that you cover in the piece. And um, we're looking forward uh, to reading it and to maybe seeing you uh, on Peaks Island uh, this summer when we take the ferry over ourselves and enjoy a, a nice sunny day out by the water. Well, thank you for inviting me. And one hint, one hint. Yes. If you come from the local area to Peaks Island and you want to have a pleasant experience, it's good to come in May, June, September, October. May, June, September, October. July and August is incredibly busy and you may not even get on the ferry. Sometimes wow. yeah. On the ferries. So we have it uh, from the local folks, May, June, or September, October. Those are the uh, the best time. Don't go to peaks during peaks uh, season. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. Uh, thank you to our audience for being here. Uh, this was really great. We really appreciate it. Uh, folks, if you're interested in more programs from Maine Historical Society, visit our website, mainhistory.org. Uh, thank you again, and have a good evening. Night.